Brian is now going to come to read God's word to us from Luke chapter 24 and Acts chapter 1. Acts 24, Acts chapter 1. Luke 24. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance. <coughs> For the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witness of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he, when he had led them out of the out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered round him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know that the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After this he said, After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid him from their sons. Then looking intently up into the sky, as he was going, when suddenly two men, dressed in white, stood be beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has, been, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. It's interesting, isn't it, that, uh, and as Donnie mentioned when we had communication a few weeks back, that uh, yes, this was known as Ascension Sunday, Ascension was actually on Thursday, we would have remembered, but within the Evangelical Free Church, it's not often highlighted, thought about, and mentioned. I suspect because lots of churches don't have a midweek meeting on a Thursday. <laughs> so does that really, you know, because it happens like when you've got Christmas and you've got Easter and you've got specific days, Easter Sunday and so on, and next week you think about Pentecost, I'm sure. But ascension happens in the middle of the week. Is that not inconsiderate? <laughs> <laughs> no. It actually makes you want to think a bit more, I hope, about what the significance of Jesus ascending into heaven is all about. And as Brian has read to us, yes, there was both were written by Luke, the accounts slightly different, but there again it's not to contradict or anything, there's no confusion. In Luke's gospel, when he wrote that gospel, he wanted a short approach. When he began the work and the writing of the history of the early church through the acts of the Holy Spirit through different people, he gave a little bit more detail. So that you and I and the people then were clear. Jesus not only died on a cross, Jesus not only rose from the dead, 
He is now ascended to be with God, his Father, our Father, the Lord of creation. Is that significant? Yes. Not just because of the promises that he made to the disciples at the time, but for us and for all of us over the centuries, it is important because if Jesus had carried on like he had between resurrection and ascension those 40 days, would that have that same connection to us? Because when he appeared after his resurrection, he appeared to two or three and disappeared. He met with another half a dozen and disappeared. And there were gaps in between. And he met with the disciples. He met with 500 at one point and 120 and this sort of thing. And then he had conversations with various people, especially the disciples. But there were gaps. And how were the disciples, and let alone anybody else, going to explain that to others? Whereas by ascending into heaven, Jesus, because he is God, can now interact with each one of us at any and all times. It's not a distant, and it hasn't now, it's not a question of being a hearsay, they believe, that's great, so it's probably true, terrific. It's now that we can have this personal encounter with Jesus Christ ourselves because he is in heaven and yet all around us. I went to a conference uh, last month, probably, somewhere like that, and there was a guy talking uh, in a session I went to. And I can't remember, and the trouble was I didn't make a proper note of it, but he was trying to explain that we think, in our way of talking, and it's written here, isn't it? Jesus was taken up into heaven. So you've got this appearance of heaven just over the clouds. And yet we know it's not because we've seen rockets go up and we've watched a rocket. And you can imagine the disciples sort of doing the same. But that's wrong, isn't it? Heaven is not up there in the ether somewhere. In fact, it's a sort of second dimension that we don't understand, but it's all around us. And Jesus is all around us at the same time as being with God the Father. And because of that, we can have these personal encounters with Jesus and he with us. And when we were singing in that last song, verse 3 mentioned that he's now, if my memory serves me right, trigger please that uh, he is now interceding for us it's as if and yet this is where the pictures come because to help us understand he's sitting on the throne next to God the Father at God's right hand so God is there Jesus the Son is there he's listening to you and to me our prayers and our groans within ourselves and where we're at and Jesus is saying, did you hear that, Father? Fred over there, he's gone. Did you? Yeah, good. And he's asking and he's talking to God in that sort of one-to-one, about you, for you, with you. And if he'd only been just resurrected and not ascended into heaven, then in one sense it would be possible, but it wouldn't. And the other side of it is that now that he's ascended and the disciples saw him taken from their sight, not in previous experience in those 40 days, they were talking with him. He was talking to them. They looked away, they looked back, and he'd gone. Have you ever had that experience? <laughs> driving along a road, and, I, and this was happening this last week, you're, following, you're driving along, you look in the rear view mirror, and there's a car following you, and you think he's getting a bit close. <clears throat> so you carry on. And then you turn, and he come, and then you look again, he's disappeared. Have you had that experience? And you think, which road did he turn off? I didn't see that happen. <laughs> but imagine the disciples and the other followers of Jesus between Resurrection Day and Ascension Day, those 40 days. 
That was what was happening in one sense. They were having this conversation. He'd shown them the hands. He said, touch it if you want to. Give me a piece of fish, whatever. They sort of go, oh. Did he say, was he gone? Now they saw him taken up into heaven. And they can say with such an authority and a surety, Jesus is still alive. Not a ghost, he is still alive. And that changed the whole flavour of where these disciples were. They knew that he was alive. And so when Stephen, the first uh, martyr, a Christian martyr, was stoned, he wasn't there at the time. He didn't see Jesus ascend. He learned about it and he had an encounter with Christ following that and following Pentecost and meeting with the disciples. When he was being stoned, what did he say? He looked and he declared, I can see Jesus, my Lord and Saviour, sitting at the right hand of God. He had that vision and an assurance that could not be denied. So when he died being stoned, he saw the glory of God in such a way which could not have been if Jesus hadn't ascended. But let's look also that at that ascension time, we've got three promises and facts that were confirmed in that time. Because Jesus, as he spoke with those disciples on that mount near Bethany, and he was talking to them, and just prior as they were walking to the mount, he was saying to them things like, you remember I told you about me and what's going to happen to me. And then he started to begin to understand it. And he said to them earlier at the table, as we thought about it, he said to them, I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. So when he ascended, that's where he's gone. He's gone as with us to see and he's preparing a place for you and me if we come to him in faith. He also said, as I'm going to go, I'm going to leave, not you alone, because you're going to have somebody. You're going to have the Holy Spirit to come and be with you, be in you, and to baptise you in such a way that would not be possible if I remained here. But I will send that Holy Spirit to you. And not just to you, 11 disciples, but to all who come to believe in Jesus. It's a promise for all of us. And the other promise that he made to the disciples and to us was that I'm going, I'll give, but I will return. Take communion and remember until I return. Three promises that were confirmed by his ascension. And how do I know that? Well, Scripture packs it out a little bit. And in fact, the disciples, as they stood there gazing up and thinking, where's he gone? We have angels. Suddenly, men in white arrive, talking, and the eleven were sort of going on them, and so on, so is he gone? And they come and they say, look, this Jesus is now ascending, where? To be with God the Father, and listen to what he's already said. He's made a promise. Go back into Jerusalem. Wait and you will be given the Holy Spirit. And while you're doing all of that and preaching and witnessing for Jesus, you're waiting until he comes. So those promises that Jesus made were reiterated by the angels as the disciples saw Jesus being taken up into heaven. And so the disciples, as they came down from that mount, as they went back into Jerusalem, what do we see them doing? Two things. One, yes, they went back up to the upper room and they held a 10-day prayer meeting, 24-7. Yeah. And you're thinking about coming for a prayer breakfast next Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Arrive at 10 o'clock, you can go at 11. So, you know, 
But then, <laughs> I, I knew you'd make it for the whole I hope you do in many ways. And we can see uh, evidence in various places over the centuries and, and indeed the tail end of last year, the beginning of this year, where prayer meetings did go 24-7 and there was revival of people coming to Christ. But that's just another good reading really happen. But they went into Jerusalem. Sometimes they went up into the upper room to be together. But they also went into the temple courts. And in the temple courts, they were doing what we've been doing this morning, praising God and worshipping God. They weren't preaching because of themselves. They were a bit scared. But they were praising God and he's declaring in praise <coughs> and maybe the Psalms, the greatness of God. That's what is said here. They went in and they went into the temple courts and they praised God. And it was probably more likely to be in the temple courts when they were praising God. First thing in that morning of Pentecost, the people heard them in the, what they called the sort of red bit, under the colonnades and that sort of You know, in, in the temple courts, you've got sort of little areas. And you've got the main sort of bit there where they were doing all the money changing. And then in the side rooms, the, the disciples were praising God. And that's probably where the Holy Spirit whacked them and they praised God. <laughs> and they were able to preach. But so you've got this picture, I hope, that they were doing something. Now, I'm not sure whether you've heard this phrase of recently. But if you've been well, in certain publications and things, Christian publications, there's a word called or a phrase called liminal space. Liminal space. Yeah, I know that's wonderful. Liminal space. Anybody heard that phrase? No. Phil. <laughs> liminal space. Let me try to explain what liminal space is. Imagination switch on. Imagine that you're at a circus and you've got trapeze artists. <laughs> this one, let's go. This one, hopefully, catches. But between this one letting go and this one coming to catch, this one is in the middle of nowhere liminal space all right they've already let go but they don't yet hold on to the new liminal space let me suggest to you on two counts one for the disciples between when jesus went and ascended was taken and ascended into heaven and they didn't know when pentecost was coming well they knew pentecost because that was a Jewish festival. But they didn't know that that was going to be the day that the Holy Spirit came upon. They didn't know that. They were just told to wait. They were in liminal space waiting for the new to happen. They'd let go in one sense because Jesus had ridden up and ascended. But the Spirit hadn't fallen. So they were stuck in this middle liminal space. What did we do in this waiting period. One thing they did, which they probably shouldn't have done, because they had limited knowledge, was that they appointed Matthias as a number 12 apostle. They based that on scripture, that's fine. But uh, if you read scripture, and if anybody can find another mention of Matthias, I'd be impressed. Because that's the only time he's mentioned in scripture. When he was appointed by him. so there's a question mark did they act when they shouldn't have done <laughs> because they were waiting but while they were waiting this is an important thing they were praising and worshiping and glorifying god but also they were together they shared time together they spent time together they worshiped god together and they waited in prayer together and can I just throw in something for you as a fellowship here? You, potentially, are in liminal space. 
The old ministry, time and work is gone. You've let go of that. You're now waiting. You don't know what the new is. You're in this liminal space. And may I suggest, based on what I've said in what has happened here, that during this liminal space, you spend time together, you pray together, you commune with each other, both formally in a communion, you meal together, you worship together, as you wait for God. With the promise that still holds true that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and direct you into the new work. Don't just assume because the Lord said, go and preach into Jerusalem, Stoke, Maidenhall, Ipswich, Samaria, Colchester, not Norwich. <laughs> <laughs> and enter the rest of the world. Yes, he told you to do that. But whilst you're in this bed, my suggestion, my thought, is that your priority is to spend time together, to pray together, to worship together, to commune with each other, and to wait and to listen to what God is saying to you about the future. Don't preempt God by deciding that you need to appoint an Matthias. Because like Matthias never appeared again in Scripture, it'd be a waste of time and effort. You need to be able to wait. And this is what the disciples would have to do. They had to go back into Jerusalem, back into Stoke Green, to wait, to be together, to wait for what God had done, it was going to do. They didn't know what they to expect. You know, you, you imagine what Peter, this bundle of excitement and yet confusion, jumping in and saying all the wrong things and yet all the right things at times in front of Jesus. And the disciples, even at this point of ascension, they still didn't really get it, did they? As they were going and he was telling them about himself and about promises to come, what did they say? Oh, by the way, when are you going to restore the kingdom of God in Israel? When are you going to give us a proper prime minister? <laughs> hey, when is it going to happen? <coughs> when are you going to put Putin down and make sure that everything is hunky-dory in Ukraine? When's it? That's what they were saying. They hadn't got it. And the danger is that we sometimes don't either. Because we look back and we think, because that happened, let's do it again. Or some time time. They were in liminal space. We may all be in liminal space at different times for different things. But we need to spend time together, we need to pray together, we need to worship God together. To wait upon what the glory of God may come upon us and to lead us. And that is what he calls us to do. And even though we know that next Sunday is Pentecost, and William Booth wrote a song, Send the Fire. You may even sing it next week. Don't know yet. <laughs> Don't know yet. But the one word of caution I would say, please, and this is me, in a lot of verse in there are words in there, we need another Pentecost. <clears throat> no, we do not need another Pentecost. Pentecost was a one-off. But we do need a refreshing of the Holy Spirit in our own lives. Because there's so often, and I plead guilty to this, that because I've had the experience of this, that, and the other over the years, there are times when I think, where's he gone? Where's he gone? I feel a bit empty here. Because we need a refreshing continually of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We don't need another Pentecost, although if the Holy Spirit pours out on the whole of Main Hall next Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, Terrific! I hope you can cope. <laughs> but Jesus ascended into heaven to confirm all the promises that he made, to confirm that his death and resurrection, the 10, 40 days earlier, as we reflect back on that, wasn't a myth, isn't just a new religion, it's an encounter with the living God in Jesus Christ. 
living word of God. Not just a belief, but an experience that we have, an experiential thing, an emotional thing that is proved by fact. Jesus is risen. Jesus is ascended. And he will return.